Welcome to the 100th episode of the Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm Elise Dorita. Our 2018 BBI annual conference is only weeks away. Today is the last day to lock in our current rate. To learn more about the conference, visit our website, probonoinst.org. Today's guest is Mary Benton from Alston and Bird, which hosts a favorite tradition of ours, the annual conference welcome reception. Thank you, Alston and Bird, for your support. Mary spoke to us from Atlanta, Georgia, where she is based. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Mary. Thank you for joining us today. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we're just going to jump right into it. Could you tell us what your early years were like and what your background was? Sure. I would say by all estimations, I had a a pretty idyllic childhood. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and uh, my dad was an English professor at SMU, and he was there for 50 plus years, partly in the administration, partly in the uh, English department. Uh, He founded the creative writing program at SMU and uh, and so was known as Mr. SMU by the time he died, which was pretty neat. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom for some parts of my early years and then uh, opened a gift shop uh, with my aunt. So she did that for about 10 to 15 years as well. And I went all through the neighborhood schools and had a really great group of friends and you know, was kind of probably a self-declared nerd growing up, (laughs) but had a lot of fun also. And um, really it was, you know, it was wonderful. Childhood, I, I, you know, I'm not one of those people that looks back and has any real big complaints um, about it at all. My parents were always very supportive. We had a pretty open house given kind of the academic bent to it, a lot of folks coming and going, and so, you know, it was great. So you ended up going to SMU, right? I did. (laughs) I applied to one college, and thankfully I got in. (laughs) Um, I think my parents were thankful, too, because uh, they didn't have to pay tuition, (laughs) so that was nice. Um, Yeah, I I stayed kind of close to to home, um, but lived on campus, and you know, obviously all of that, but, but it was great. And my dad was still teaching when I was there and we would have lunch every so often. And I actually ended up taking his uh, big elective class that was called the myth of the American West. And uh, I had promised him that I would not tell, you know, no one would know that I was his daughter, right? (laughs) And so I was like, please just let me take your class. I actually dropped a class that I didn't like and got into his. And my then boyfriend, now husband, was also in his class and a bunch of our fraternity and sorority uh, colleagues. And so, you know, the first several classes I was in the back and I didn't say anything and no one kind of put two and two together except for the folks that really knew me well. And there was probably about 80 people in the class. And then one day I was late to class and I opened up the door and my dad was already lecturing and he turned to me and was like, and tardiness will not be tolerated in this class. And I was just broke down in tears. I was like, Oh daddy, I'm so sorry. (laughs) I've had a horrible day. (laughs) That kind of thing. So our cover was blown. <laughs> um, but, you know, it didn't really matter. It was it was great. It was so incredibly, um, you know, great to have a experience for my dad to also be my teacher because I'd seen how passionate he was about teaching and how impactful he'd been on other students and, and everything. And so it really was one of the highlights of my, my life was being in that class with him. And yeah, that must have been a... Uh nice to have in like this big change in your life in college to have your dad right there just when you needed him. It was, it was really, it was really very special. Um, my dad recently passed away and we've been going through his stuff and, um, I have found a ton of notes that he kept where I would go by his office and I guess, you know, at times he wasn't there and, and I would say, you know, daddy, I'm just coming by to say hello or, Daddy, I really need to talk to you, or something like that. And he'd saved all those little scraps of paper. 
That's um, so sweet. For stuff. So yeah, it really was, uh, you know, kind of allowed me to, obviously to grow up and have the college experience, but as you say, to have a, a home base as well, which was good for me. Great. So when and how did you just decide to become a lawyer? I mentioned my boyfriend, now my husband, um, Chip, and we met in college when I was a sophomore and 19 years old, and um, he was a junior, and he was set on being a lawyer. His father um, is still practicing law to this day in Athens, and um, I did not really know what I wanted to do, uh, particularly. I was a liberal arts major, history and political science. SMU is a very big liberal arts school. Uh, And I had thought about teaching. And at that point, I wanted to, you know, get my PhD and then be a professor and looking kind of at the road ahead. That's a lot of moving around and a lot of moving parts and everything has to fall into place just right. And, you know, to get tenure is harder and harder. And so I started looking into the practice of law, kind of chip suggestion and realized, you know, how much I could do with, with a law degree. And so really decided on that probably my junior year of college. And I went straight through to law school, applied to law schools in my senior year, and uh, thankfully was uh, accepted to to Texas, and so got to spend three years in Austin. Oh, I've always wanted to go there. That's on my bucket list of places right next to my desk right now. Uh, oh, it should be. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love my time there. So Georgia is a bit of a ways from Texas. How did you get to Austin and Bird? So Chip uh, is from Athens, and so, you know, as I said, we started dating when I was just a sophomore, and by the time we were, you know, really serious um, and knew that we were going to end up together, uh, we started thinking about where we were going to live, and he was very interested in, in coming back to Georgia and coming to Atlanta, and I was not dead set. I'm, I'm probably one of the biggest Texans you will meet, but I was actually not dead set on living in any particular place in Texas. I didn't really want to stay in Dallas. I'd been there for a long time. Uh, the type of law that I wanted to do was not particularly uh, available in Austin. Um, I honestly didn't have a desire to go to Houston and and so I was very open to coming to, to Atlanta. And after I visited a couple of times, I was sold. So I started interviewing at firms. And at that time, there were very few firms from Atlanta that interviewed on campus at Texas. There was kind of, a, I guess, a, a stigma attached to people from Texas that they would come to Atlanta, they would have a great summer experience, and they would go back to a Texas firm. And so there were only a handful of firms that even interviewed at Texas, and Alston and Bird was one of those, thankfully. And so when I was engaged in the interview process, I was, you know, looking for a firm where I could be long-term, where I could, you know, practice in the areas that I was interested in practicing in. And then the pro bono culture was a very big um area of significance for me. It was really important that wherever I ended up had a culture of service and um, and pro bono. And Alston and Bird, certainly with its history, fit that bill. So I summered there in the summer of 1995, was given an offer and moved to uh, Atlanta right after I graduated and got married in 1996 and took the bar exam during the 1996 Summer Olympics. Wow. I remember when that happened. I'm a big Summer Olympics fan. I want to go one day. That's also somehow all my travel bucket lists are coming up in this conversation. Um, I know. So it was crazy because we, you know, those of us who took the bar in that, that summer, it was in Dalton, Georgia, which is about an hour and 10 minutes north of Atlanta because all of the other venues were being used for the Olympics. And so, you know, I was doing the bar review and 
all of that and then taking the exam that first weekend of the Olympics. And so then afterwards, thankfully, I got to enjoy a, a good deal of it, you know, after the, the bar exam was over. So that was good. But I still remember eating dinner by myself, like after the first night of the exam. And I called my husband and I was like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm on my way to track and field. You know, Michael Johnson is running a second race. <laughs> With his shoes, and I'm like, that is so not fair. I'm eating by myself and about to take the bar exam on the second day tomorrow in Dalton. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit more about the firm? So Alston and Bird really has a long and storied history of uh, pro bono and service. Philip Alston, one of our founders, was one of the signatories for the resolution that created the Atlanta Legal Aid Society. And so it goes way back to even our founding partner. And that culture of pro bono and service and giving back and really being integrated into the communities where we practice is something that is incredibly important to the firm. And it's something that we work at. Um, you know, we know that it's not just going to, to continue or happen without a concerted effort to make sure that uh, that culture of service and commitment to pro bono continues. And as we have grown across the, the country, um, we have tried to ensure that, you know, all of the offices have that same dedication and commitment to, to pro bono, and I think we've done a really good job of that. Yeah, we're definitely going to also get more into that and the firm's pro bono program in a bit. So you were talking about all the offices that you have. You said you had eight offices across the country, and then you have the international ones. What's your favorite firm office to visit? I enjoy going to all of them for a variety of reasons. You know, each of our offices has a, a different personality, and um, one of the great things that I've loved about being in this pro bono partner role is the opportunity to develop friendships uh, in all of the offices and, you know, not just within uh, the practice group where, where I've, um, you know, been a lawyer, which is tax. And so I really enjoy going to, to all of the offices and visiting with all of the attorneys. I, from a kind of selfish perspective, my favorite offices tend to be the ones where I have family <laughs> because I get to kill two birds with one stone. So since I grew up in Dallas, I love going to the Dallas office and having the opportunity to stay there. And I have a niece in New York. Uh, so that one is, is great to, to go visit. And I have uh, my sister and nephew and cousin are in Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. I enjoy going to those and getting to see family when I have a business reason to, to travel. Well, it sounds like you have family in a good chunk of them, so that works out nicely. And exactly. <laughs> you just mentioned that you were in the tax practice group. What drove you to choose that practice of law? You know, I, I think looking back at, at law school, and, and it's always so interesting to me that we ask second-year law students to determine what they're going to do with the rest of their life, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's fortunate for me that it that it worked out. I think it's always you know, great that so many people actually stick with what they decided in that summer between their second and third year of law school. But I ended up in tax, I think, primarily because I really enjoyed the code-based classes. I had an excellent tax professor at the University of Texas. Um, I really enjoyed the work that I did when I was a summer associate uh, at Alston and Bird in the, in the tax group. I've always been very interested as well in policy and theory and in constitutional law. And so the tax practice that, that I have in state and local tax kind of marries the two of those. So there's kind of the code-based statutory aspect of tax law and then the kind of constitutional policy um, area. So, you know, we are in, in brief in state and local tax uh, cite international shoe and um, Asahi and other con law cases that you you know study in 
uh, civil procedure <laughs> a lot, as well as in uh, as in con law when we deal with you know equal protection and the First Amendment to some extent, um, due process, and the Commerce Clause. So it's an interesting practice. Yeah, it definitely uh, sounds like it because we we have a few tax lawyers on, but um, I feel like it's a mix of like people who juggle both. So. What in your background or personality sparked your passion for access to justice? So I would say in one word, it would be my faith. And uh, I am a practicing Methodist. um, And John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism, uh, emphasized service and the idea that we are the hands and feet of Christ, um, that we are to you know, do unto the least of these and give and provide as we would for, for anyone. Um, and so really my commitment to, to service kind of stems from that. Um, I, I see it as a way to live out my faith. Um, I think also I've been incredibly blessed. I mean, as I, I said, you know, my, my childhood was certainly not without ups and downs, but overall it was, a very good one. Um, I never really wanted for anything, certainly not anything materially. And I realized that that is not the norm. Um, I realized how incredibly privileged I have been and am, and that really motivates me to want to give back and to make life better for others. And so, you know, I, kind of tried to to do that in a variety of ways. And once I started law school and realized the gap that exists for those who have and have not, it really spurred me to want to make a difference in that area. So pro bono is definitely a great way to um, give back in an act of service. We'd like to learn a little bit more about Alston & Bird's pro bono program. Can you provide an overview? Sure, I would love to. I think in in one word in describing the program would be organic. We really do try to meet people where they are. Uh, I say that pro bono kind of lies at the intersection of your passion and your talent. So what are you very passionate about? Where do you want to make a difference? And then what skill sets do you have that you can utilize to make that? And that's where pro bono lies. And so it, it really is about encouraging people and meeting people where they are in terms of what do you want to, to be involved in. And so we have a, a great commitment to pro bono, as I mentioned um, previously, and we do a lot of different types of projects. We don't have one particular signature project, I wouldn't say. But we have and work very hard to develop and maintain relationships with nonprofit legal service providers in each of our communities so that we have kind of standing projects that people can become involved in if they're wanting to. Um, And we also work with people to develop their own projects. Is there something that we're not offering? Then come talk to us, and we'll be happy to help develop that. Um, And in fact, one of the immigration programs that we have out of Atlanta called GAIN, which is the Georgia Asylum and Immigration Network, was kind of created um, in that vein where there was not an immigration nonprofit that was doing um, work with volunteer attorneys in Atlanta. And so a number of Alston and Bird uh, people decided that, you know, that should change and went about working to create to create gain in a, in a partnership with the ball. Great. So can we talk a little bit more about the pro bono leadership team, like how you all work together and who is responsible for what? Sure. I am, first off, incredibly blessed and fortunate to work with passionate and talented individuals in the pro bono sphere at the firm. It's um, really, you know, incredible, and there's so many people that are committed to 
to the work that we do. And first and foremost, I would say that it's Cheryl Naja, who's our director of pro bono and community service. And Cheryl and I work together every day to kind of do the, the day-to-day running of the program, I would say. Really, it's our job to make sure that our attorneys are supported, they're encouraged, that we're available to them to the extent, you know, there are matters that need supervision or there are conflicts that arise or issues that come up or anything like that. And and so, you know, we both uh, work on that in, in the day-to-day. I'd say Cheryl is really kind of the, the most valuable member of our team. She's the creative force behind a lot of what we do and she's also someone who particularly younger associates feel very very comfortable talking to uh, in terms of issues that they're having or projects that they want to undertake and so that's incredibly valuable. Uh, We have a structure that's probably a lot like other firms where we have a pro bono committee and on that committee we have chairs of, of those committees in each of our offices. So there's an individual partner um, or senior associate or counsel who is responsible for the kind of day-to-day in their individual office across the firm. And those individuals, and me and Cheryl, make up the kind of executive committee of the pro bono leadership team. And then we have a very, very robust pro bono committee. Uh, I think we have close to 90 people who are on our committee, and we make a very concerted effort to make sure that that committee is diverse in terms of the population of the firm, not only in the the kind of general sense that, you know, we talk about diversity, but also among practice groups, among experience levels, among staff and paralegals and uh, attorneys, and that type of thing, so that we're making sure that we're getting a voice from each of the areas of the firm um, so that we can really address and be responsive to, you know, what people are are needing and wanting in terms of pro bono projects. Great. So that's how everyone kind of spends their time. Uh, But how do you spend your time? Is there anything you wish you could be doing more or less of? Well, let's see. I, I'm sure I spend my time a, a way a lot of other people uh, do in this role and capacity, and that's attending a lot of meetings, have a lot of calls. So I, I gave Cheryl a coffee mug uh, for Christmas that said I just survived another meeting that could have been an email. <laughs> <laughs> and so we try to be very cognizant of the fact that people's time is valuable and we want to make the most of it and so our, our motto is to have crisp meetings uh, and things like that. But, you know, we're doing that with um, with the committee, with different working groups within the committee, um, with our associates and um, our attorneys across the firm, um, making sure that, you know, our partners are in, engaged um, as well. And we have a really high percentage of partners who do a significant amount of pro bono work. So very fortunate in that, um, to that extent that they're leading by example. Um, so, you know, also developing the relationships, as I mentioned, with nonprofit legal service providers and, uh, and supervising cases and, you know, dealing with kind of just the, the administrative tasks of that, uh, of that role. I think you asked if there's anything that, you know, I wish I had. Oh, yeah. If there's anything you have you want to say about that you've been doing more of or want to do more of or less of. This year, I'm really hoping to focus more kind of strategically on on strategic issues and have time to do to do that and not feel like we're just jumping from meeting to meeting. You know, I'm really trying to be cognizant of the, the fact that my calendar does not need to be chock full of meetings to be productive that, um, you know, I I really hope that I have more time to kind of just block out, um, you know, chunks of time where I can, you know, sit and think and be um, strategic in terms of the direction our program is going and how we're supporting our people in that. So I really hope to do more, more of that, um, you know, kind of time in the, in the future. 
Great. So Alston and Bird utilizes many fun games and awards to promote pro bono at the firm. I saw a taste of this when I sat in at Law Firm 101 last year with Cheryl. Uh, she had me pass out these cute little fortune cookies. <laughs> what have you found works best to incentivize and encourage lawyers at Alston and Bird to do pro bono work? Could you tell us about some of your creative recognition efforts and other events? Sure. You know, this is one of my favorite areas, and it really is, you know, where the kudos go to Cheryl because she's so incredibly creative and she's constantly thinking about different ways that we can do exactly that, which is encourage and support our our attorneys and what they're doing and the projects that they're working on and the cases that they're taking. Um, you know, as you know, some of these cases can drag on, and some of them are incredibly hard. Um, to do from, you know, not just a, a kind of lawyerly aspect, but emotionally. Um, and a lot of them can take time away from practice or away from, you know, families. And so it's really important that the work that's being done is, is valued. Um, you know, I think first off, providing meaningful projects and providing the support and responsiveness to the attorneys who are working on those cases is extremely vital. You know, pro bono kind of sells itself. Once people do it, um, they want to keep doing it because, you know, it just really is, is fulfilling and meaningful. Um, but then in addition to that, I think it's really important to let people know that we value what they do. And so we do that in a number of different ways and have, and I'm sure that we'll keep coming up with creative ways to do it. But we have a quarterly newsletter that highlights cases from um, all of our offices, and um, it's it's incredibly well done. It's electronic newsletter uh, that goes out, and um, our our um, graphic uh, um, what do you call that? Graphic design. <laughs> yeah, our graphic design folks make sure that that it's um, you know done incredibly well. Um, we have a pro bono week. Every year in the summer, when our summer associates are here, that focuses on different pro bono efforts. And so we might have lunch and learns about uh, programs, or we might have a firm-wide discussion about um, something. So this past summer, it was criminal justice reform, where we had a panel um, that came together to do that and then had discussions afterwards. Um, we also recognize people during pro bono week in a variety of ways. And one of those is door hangers. Um, I think we might have passed those out at one of the sessions uh, at, at a um, PBI conference a couple of years ago. But we put door hangers on, on everyone's door who has done some pro bono. So we'll say, you know, congratulations, you've done up to 25 hours of pro bono. And then, you know, at up to 50 hours of pro bono and then over 50 hours and uh, that type of thing. And so it really is kind of a, a mark of those people who were involved in the last year as to what they were doing. And then we send out a recognition email as well that recognizes all of the attorneys that, that build 50 uh, or more hours on pro bono and, and 100 or more hours on pro bono. And, you know, every year the list keeps getting longer and longer and longer. And we used to do pictures for everyone, and now we just do pictures for the 100 plus and names for the 50 plus because there's so many on there and we during the fall um, to, when the new associates start and we do a lot of training in the fall because it's kind of a you know a fresh start after the summer and school's back in session and everyone's kind of settling down um, so during that we also recognize people with um, perhaps an individual cupcake or popcorn or something like that um, and we also send notes to to folks, um, you know, with perhaps even a Starbucks card or Amazon gift card or, or something like that. So a significant victory or, you know, a particularly hard, you know, loss on a case that was well fought. Um, and during pro bono week, uh, our managing partner, Richard Hayes, and I send out a kind of congratulatory note to everyone who has participated in, in pro bono activities, which is, you know, particularly meaningful, I think. Positive reinforcement like that is, um, yeah, really helpful. 
yeah, another area that we focus on is is recognizing our people through awards, both internal and external. And I know that, you know, the vast majority of people do not get engaged in pro bono and do the hard work because they want an award or want to be recognized. But I think it's always extremely important to do the recognition and to let people know across the firm what everyone's working on. It really is um, a, an incredibly humbling experience for me. And I know the other folks that, that select our internal awards and um, we give out four pro bono awards every year and we solicit nominations starting in in November and so through November and December we have a lot of nominations that come in and we compile those and then the selection committee which is actually comprised of all past award winners uh, gets together first week or so of January and and selects the the winners and those are given out at a firm-wide program um, and we call them the, the Abbey Awards, kind of a takeoff on the Emmys, but, you know, the Alston and Bird Abbey Awards. And um, there we give out pro bono awards, diversity, mentoring, the top echelon award for executive staff and, and everything. So it really is a, uh, you know, kind of firm-wide presentation for, for those. And uh, everyone who's been nominated for an award is listed on the website with what they did and mentioned in the program, and then we give out give out the awards. So I think that's something that's significant, and and really I, I hope goes a long way to um, to recognize folks for their efforts. And then um, you know we do a I think a pretty good job of nominating our attorneys for external awards for organizations that they're involved with, for their alumni organizations, and and things like that. And Cheryl does a, a great job of kind of maintaining a list of, of these awards and making sure that we're including our folks in the nominating process for that. Great. And Alston Bird has also won our Pickering Award in the past at our conference. Um, so I thought that'd be a funny thing to mention. And also at the conference, Alston and Bird hosts a pre-conference welcome reception, which is another example of Alston and Bird event that um, we really enjoy and we're really thankful to the firm for uh, supporting us in that event. So what is the pro bono and access to justice culture like in Atlanta? I know that's a big question. It is a a big question, but I think in one word, the answer would be very collaborative. Um, It's, it's amazing how, you know, our, our, you know, litigators from Alston and Bird can go against litigators at another firm and, in, in billable matters and obviously, you know, advocate and represent your clients ferociously in that context and then turn around and we work together extremely well on pro bono matters. And I think the, the kind of general consensus among the, the pro bono uh, firm leadership within Atlanta is that we need to be doing what is in the best interest of our city and our community and our state. And we can do that best by working together and recognizing the different strengths that people bring to the t- table and, and leveraging those to, to really work in collaborative ways to solve significant issues um, in our, in our community. And so I think that's uh, really important. We have what we call the Atlanta pro bono round table, which is the, pro bono partners and um, directors from the large firms in Atlanta. And we get together on a regular basis and um, have worked to develop programming and educational programs uh, for the greater community at large, um, other firms as well as nonprofit legal service providers to support them. And, um, And then we work on kind of issue specific work as well, and I'll highlight the immigration working group um, that is broader than just the uh, kind of pro bono uh, leadership of the firm, but is is really instigated um, and led uh, at the firm level. And so uh, I think it's, you know, as I said, extremely collaborative. Um, we also have a wonderful variety of very strong nonprofit legal service providers who are really at the cutting edge of providing legal services to the indigent community and 
partner extremely well with law firms um, and are really, you know, always asking how can we support your attorneys in the work that they're doing, which is fantastic because, you know, one of our, um, what we want to do is, is be supporting them. Um, but it really is great to also have um, the the legal service organizations recognize that there are certain um, uh, strains on attorneys um, and how can they improve their programming and their projects and their um, cases to kind of really, you know, embrace that to the extent that they get more volunteers. Um, so we have a, a great, um, a, a great community of organizations that provide great training, education, and supervision to all the attorneys that volunteer in Atlanta on this project. We also have an incredible bar, both the, the Georgia Bar um, and, the, and the Atlanta Bar Association are both extremely committed to pro bono services um, in a variety of ways. And, and so we really are, I think, very fortunate in, in Atlanta to have such a, a great pro bono culture and a commitment to service. That is a great segue into my next question. The Atlanta Bar Association in 2016 awarded you its pro bono award for your work with the Truancy Intervention Project. What got you interested in that organization? Yes, well, talk talk about humbling. That was a a wonderful moment for me, but then also, you know, extremely humbling to the extent that, you know, I feel like I'm just one person who's trying to do (laughs) the, the best we can do to to make a difference, and there's so many others who are so deserving of that recognition. Um, and and so it was really meaningful to me and to be recognized for TIP, which is an organization that I've been involved with for 20-plus years, was extremely meaningful. And TIP is the Truancy Intervention Project, and it was founded by my former law partner, uh, Terry Walsh, and former juvenile court judge, Linda Hatchett. And really what drew me to it is, is its mission, which is to determine what is underneath um, and really what is the, the critical reasons that kids are not coming to school. And so it kind of takes truancy as a, as a symptom of something bigger going on in a child's life and kind of peels back the layers of the onion to see what support services can we provide to this child, to this family, so that they can get back on track. And it, it is a really special project, I think, for that reason. I was interested in it initially because my passion had been children and education, and so it's really kind of fit within what I was already familiar with in terms of service and, um, and volunteering from just college and law school days. And to really understand that, you know, we were using the, the legal system and the juvenile court to, you know, really determine what is the core issue of, of why um, kids are missing school. Um, because we all know what happens when, when kids miss school and it's, it's not anything good. So how can we get them back on track, but really how can we provide those wraparound services and a holistic solution to families. And uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for, um, you know, legal skills development, but it's really a great opportunity to, to develop relationships with kids. Oftentimes they're coming in contact with, you know, someone who's not only graduated from college but from law school, and you can really help them see what's possible and provide a lot of hope and that's you know certainly something that's meaningful and, and fulfilling. Yeah, uh, it's definitely a, a good way to look at it as a symptom, like you were saying, uh, that there's usually more going on that's causing this rather than just isolating it as just truancy. So what are some other examples of pro bono cases that have been particularly meaningful to you? Oh, my goodness. There have been, there've been so many, but I guess in singling out some, I would say that the work I've done with, with Georgia Appleseed and the National Appleseed Network has been extremely uh, fulfilling to me. Personally, I mentioned before that I like policy, I like theory, and one of the reasons that I was 
really drawn to TIP as a mission was, you know, as you said, kind of peeling back the layers and determining what is the underlying reason for this. And Georgia Appleseed is a center for law and policy. It's one of 18 um, centers across the, the country. And we have one in Mexico City uh, as well. And the goal is to kind of advocate on a strategic or a systemic level for changes that need to be made in the justice system so that we don't keep coming up with the same problem over and over and over. Um, and so some of the projects that I've worked on and that Appleseed has been involved in is a rewrite of the Georgia Juvenile Code that hadn't been touched in since like the 1950s. Um, and so we had a project and a ton of firms were um involved in this, and I happen to be fortunate to be the leader at Alston and Bird to interview stakeholders in the juvenile justice system and put together a report about what they said the issues were, the complications, the, you know, what they would like to see in a code, and there were 10 of those reports that culminated in, in kind of one, um, one big report, and at the same time, uh, someone was working on a model juvenile code. So we put those two together and then in partnership with uh, Emory, um, the Barton Law Clinic at Emory and Voices for Georgia's Children, which is kind of a lobbying organization, we were able to pass legislation to, to effectively rewrite the entire juvenile code. And it's been extremely successful. Um, Georgia Appleseed just undertook kind of an assessment of the, the juvenile code last year and uh, really found out that it, it's working. Certainly need more resources, <laughs> which I'm sure is true with any type of legislation that, that goes into effect. So more resources would be good, but really in terms of the, the law, it's good. Um, so that's been something that's been meaningful. Uh, we have an Innocence Project case uh, for a gentleman in prison in South Georgia, who his case was heard at least in 1996. That's when I graduated from law school. He has been held in prison without an appeal until we took the case about three years ago, um, which is just absolutely just really boils <laughs> my blood <laughs> in terms of, of that. Um, three judges that have heard the case and the prosecuting attorney have all been disbarred in his case. It really is amazing. <laughs> so we have, we have his case now, um, you know, we're doing DNA testing or motions for DNA testing and the new trial and things. And so that's been extremely challenging, but also rewarding to work on. Um, and that's still in the work. And then, you know, I really like the cases also that are discreet, um, that, you know, really are, are not difficult at all for an attorney to do, but are so incredibly impactful to the people for whom you're providing the service, such as wills, end-of-life planning documents, guardianships, and to really see what people are dealing with and the burdens that they're bearing, it really makes me in awe of how they're handling that. And then to know that securing a guardianship for an adult child who is, you know, very autistic and needs the supervision of, of a guardian to allow that to, or to, you know, be a part of that happening for, for the mom and the child. It's just incredibly rewarding. And to provide a will for an individual um, who then tells you that they're so grateful and now they'll be able to sleep better at night. That's the kind of stuff that's also incredibly rewarding. Those are some great examples. Um, and they're also different. So it's, I guess, a lesson that pro bono cases come in all shapes and sizes, but at the end of the day, they're all rewarding. So what is on the horizon for the pro bono program? Do you guys have anything new in the works? So I think, you know, and I mentioned when we were talking about how, how I personally spend my time that I wanted to be more kind of reflective and strategic. And I think that's an overall goal this year that Cheryl and I have for the, the program. 
as a whole. And um, we shared that with the committee at our first meeting of the year last week. And um, we're really going to spend some time examining what's working, what could we be doing better, um, talking to people who are in the trenches doing the work. We're going to talk to the people who are hesitant to get involved, ask them why, um, and, and really kind of take the year to, to examine, you know, are we in the right spaces? Should we be taking on, um, you know, a significant matter in this office or that office? Is there any particular area that we need to focus on? Do the dollars that we spend kind of coincide with the work that we're doing? And I think we have a general sense of that, and we have an, an excellent program, and it works really well, but I think there's always room for improvement. Um, and I think it's always wise to take the time every now and again to reflect and see what are we doing well. Um, I think in the meantime, we're going to keep on doing what we do, which is find the critical needs and try to address those. And I think that's something that, that Alston and Bird has, has always desired to do and that we've, we've hopefully done, done well. Um, you know, one example of that is, is a name change project that we have for um, transgender clients who are going um, through that process and need a legal name change. And we have a project with um, attorneys at Coca-Cola to provide that legal service. And so it's something, again, that's discreet, but it's incredibly meaningful, and it's a need that's, that's not being met elsewhere. So if you had a magic wand... What is one thing that you would change about law firm pro bono or access to justice? <laughs> How many times do I get to use it? <laughs> Just one time. So, you know, I, I think two things. One, one for, one for law firm pro bono and then, and then one for access to justice. And I'll, I'll say the law firm pro bono one. I, I wish that kind of pro bono would become more a part of the practice for attorneys as opposed to perhaps being kind of something that they feel like they, you know, are being pressured to do or a box to check, you know, so that they have something to say in their review. I, I really wish that it would become something that is, you know, kind of on your plate from the beginning. And, you know, that's something that we try to instill in, in new associates when they join and summer associates that, you know, if this is something that you're passionate about, then make it part of your practice. Have a pro bono practice in addition to your billable practice. Find what you're passionate about and what you want to do and, and you know, make that part of the, the overall practice of law. Um, and so I would love to see more people kind of embracing that, um, that kind of concept of pro bono. Um, in terms of access to justice, I think really what's needed to kind of move it to the next level, because, you know, as, as you and I both know, the, the gap in access to justice is significant and it's growing. And no matter what good law firms are doing and volunteers are doing and nonprofit legal service providers are doing, and no matter what support we're offering, there is a large portion of the population who do not feel that their legal needs are being met because they don't have access to a lawyer. And what I would wave my magic wand in, in that space is to have people outside the legal arena realize how significant and important it is that we provide access to the legal system for everyone and why it's so, you know, vital to a uh, functioning society to a democracy for business purposes, even, um, you know, to have individuals who, you know, have access to an attorney for their consumer finance issues, for their landlord tenant issues, for domestic violence issues, for immigration issues, for, you know, family law issues. Um, those types of things are just, you know, really fundamental to a, a, community, um, to a society that functions well and to a democracy. And so to have more people outside the legal 
fear embrace that, I think, would be a game changer. That's a very well put. Those things are kind of things that I think uh, light fires under people to get involved. And uh, hopefully this inspires all of our listeners. So who is your pro bono role model or access to justice role model and why? Um, I uh, have three that I'm going to mention. And um, the first is Terry Walsh. I mentioned him before, mm-hmm. the, the founder of the Transit Intervention Project. And He's someone who, um, when I was a summer associate and, and I talked about how important uh, having a great pro bono culture was to, to me and joining any law firm, um, Terry was the one that really showed me what Alston and Bird was doing and the commitment that the firm had to pro bono and access to justice. And um, he took me under his wing as, both a, a mentor and an inspiration as to what good you could do um, by, you know, really focusing on on the need in our communities and going about to build together a team and solve that problem. And so Terry is definitely one of one of my inspirations and continues to be with the work that he continues to do with Tip even in his retirement. Um, John C is another. John was our chair of the DC Pro Bono Committee uh, in uh, at the firm, and he retired at the end of last year. And um, at his retirement, I called him the kind of moral conscience of our pro bono program. And um, he really was to the extent that he always uh, advocated for us to be courageous in the pro bono that we wanted to undertake. Um, you know, he was one of those that represented, uh, several Guantanamo Bay inmates and, you know, was courageous in his advocacy on that and never wavering that it was the right thing to do from, uh, from a justice perspective. And, uh, he, is another one who, you know, really just lived out his commitment to pro bono in addition to being an incredible attorney um, on, you know, his billable practice, which was customs law. Um, And then finally, another one of my kind of inspirations is someone that I work with every day, and that's Cheryl. And she's not an attorney, but she is as committed to access to justice as anyone that I know. And she works tirelessly every day to make sure that our communities are better and she promotes this kind of connectedness through service um, for those in the firm, uh, in all of our offices, and then folks in the Atlanta community. And so I really, I I probably don't tell her enough, but uh, she is an inspiration to me and someone that I'm extremely fortunate to to work with on a daily basis. Those are amazing choices. Uh, we are big fans of Cheryl here. As we uh, worked with her at the conference last year, and I got to meet her. So thank you for joining us today and spending your time with us. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, Lisa. I did too. New and archived episodes of the podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Please take a moment to leave an Apple Podcast review. It is quick and easy to do. We would appreciate the feedback and would help make it easier for other listeners to find the show and expand the conversation about pro bono and access to justice. We'd love to hear from you. Send your comments, feedback, and questions to pro bono at probonoinst.org.